Hey guys, welcome to the Talk Android podcast. I'm Jared, and I'm here with Eric. Hi. And Peter. Hey there. So uh, we actually got Peter on the podcast today. Um, he was at IFA for us last week. Um, saw all the cool gadgets and stuff that everybody was showing off. Um, so we're gonna we'll dive into that a little bit later. Um, first up, we wanted to talk about the Galaxy Note Nine. Um, it's been out for a couple weeks now. Seems really cool. Seems really expensive. Um, I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with it any more than I have. Uh, Seems like all the news surrounding it, pre-orders were good, sales seem like they're pretty strong, um, so it seems like people are actually buying it. Yeah, it seems like they've got a winner. Um, like, It's more impressive than the Note 8 was, perhaps. Um, it feels like it has its own personality again. See, to um, me, it's it still kind of feels like more of the same, though. I kind I of think... agree. Go for it. Oh no, I kind of agree. It's uh, it just seems a, a little more of the same. The two things I like are the what do you have like five hundred twelve gigabytes of storage now, an option. Yeah, yeah. And then the remote S Pen is kind of cool, but otherwise, uh, I mean, those are the two standouts for me. Otherwise, I don't know. I think for me, it's the S Pen, um, but also the B, the bigger battery, so it's also a factor. Um, so there's three things that makes it different from the S Nine. Or the S9 Plus. Right. Yeah, and I, <clears throat> I do like that this year. Um, I feel like the S Pen has almost stagnated, which is weird because that's like the defining feature of the Note line. But I feel like it's basically been the same S Pen since I think the Galaxy Note 3. I think that's when they like increase the pressure sensitivity levels to however many it's up to. Um, but after yeah. that, it's just been the it's it's the same pen. So you would you would think with that being your selling point, you'd want to constantly improve what that can do. And they've only just started doing that. So I, I do agree with that part. The Bluetooth in it, it's neat. Yeah, it I actually think... feels a lot different in the hand over the S nine plus. It's heavier. Um, yeah, but the S nine plus tends to cut into the sides of your hand, sides of your palm, and your holder. Uh, the Note 9 is just that little bit rounder, more comfortable to hold, despite being a little bit longer. How does it compare to the Note 8 holding them side by side? Have you held those side by side? Unfortunately not. No. Uh, they didn't have that on the stand. Because yeah. that's what I like about the Note, is that uh, it, it's all, at least in the last couple of years, it's always just been that little bit of a rounder, more comfortable device to hold than the uh, the S8 and the S9. Yeah, they, they always seem quite sharp on the edges. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's still true, though. I think the Note, um, like playing with the Note 9, it still feels a little more squared off. I, I really like the way the S9 feels. It's sleek and rounded, and um, I'm a big fan of that one. But the Notes have always just... Like Peter said, they're they're sharper on the corners. I don't love that. Maybe you guys do. I personally, I've always liked the S line a little bit more than the Note line, but I also never really use the S Pen. I don't really take advantage of what it can do. So just from a, a an appearance standpoint and from a size standpoint, I I'd get an S nine over a Note. I yeah. would definitely go for the Note line. I, I always used to have them, the Note 2, Note 1, 2, 3, 4. I would have had the 5 if they brought it over to the UK. Oh, I forgot about that. You guys got yeah. like the S7 Edge Plus or the S6 the Edge S6. Plus? Yeah, <laughs> which I bought, but and it was a nice enough phone. But that was the last Samsung phone I used. Hmm. The uh, Boy, I hated the Galaxy S6. That was a terrible phone. Yeah. The, the Plus model was better, but not by much. Yeah. What I liked about the S6 is it, they introduced like the proper edge. So I, it's just was kind of the start of a new design era for Samsung. So that's... Did you that's have one? Only, 
I had the Essex Edge, yeah. Oh, see, man, my thing, the battery life was just terrible. Performance was awful. Memory management was bad. Like, I, I have... I had maybe a 10 minute drive to work. I could unplug that thing, walk out my front door, get to work, 85% battery. Yeah, it wasn't a great phone, but it was just such a cool looking phone. Yeah, Definitely. I'd agree with that. We were actually talking earlier um, how the, I think the Note 2 has, might be my favorite Android phone ever. Either that or the Droid Incredible. Got great memories of both of those. I actually yeah. bought the Note 2 twice. There you go, you liked it too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, bought it the first time, got bored of it a little, and thought, I'll try the Nexus 4. Bought the Nexus 4, managed uh, or endured three days of it, and then sold it for Note 2 again. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. It's uh, good old Google hardware. Oh, yeah. That one didn't have LTE, did it? The Nexus 4? I don't. No, oh, I did it. That's the one with the with the glass, that weird glass back. Yeah, like it yeah. looked like diamonds on the back. Yeah, I think that was just yeah, that didn't have LTE. I remember that one being like compromised. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I don't think it even had LTE. That was the first uh, LG made one, I believe. Yeah. To be fair though, I had a Galaxy Nexus that did have LTE on Verizon, and uh, boy, that was also just a terrible experience. That phone should not have had LTE. I think that phone, did that phone get like an update where the sc- they ruined the screen, all of a sudden it just became this washed out, weird yellow? I think they did that because the burn-in was so bad. Is that what it was? They wouldn't really tell us why, but all of a sudden the screen just looked terrible. Yep, the, because uh, I had one of those, um, and it was great, but I broke it and had to get another one, and the, the, the refurbished one that I got, it did have a little bit of burn-in, where the, oh. like that old school hollow navigation bar yeah so i think that's why they they adjusted the tint of the screen to maybe reduce the burn-in maybe it worked but i got rid of mine not too long after that because i just got sick of it yeah it ruined the experience for me i mean i just couldn't look at the screen anymore so i sold it yeah (laughs) um so what do you guys think about the uh finally getting some rumors that the s10 is going to have the uh, in display fingerprint scanner i'm a big fan yeah, have you actually used one yet? I haven't used one, but I, I don't I don't want the fingerprint scanner to go away. So I like how this new technology is going to start, hopefully, hitting a lot of these flagship phones. Yeah, Peter, have you used a phone with an in-display fingerprint scanner? Actually, not. Uh, I've seen someone use it. Okay. That's about it. Yeah, you seem like you run into that more than we do because uh, I don't think there's even one available in the U.S. at all. Is no, Viva, I, I think Viva right now is the only one that's got one on the market. I'm, I don't know if I'm wrong about Huawei's that. Huawei's Porsche edition thing has it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah but that was supposed to be terrible. All the uh, people I know that have used it or had one, uh, they all complain about the fin- in-display fingerprint reader. Unless you get it like 98% exact, it does nothing. Mm. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Um, yeah, OnePlus is, they confirmed it the other day that they're definitely doing it in the 6T. So I think that'll be the first, uh, first big mainstream offering where we see it. But I don't know, I'm still a little concerned, um, especially for Samsung doing it. Just because Samsung, if they put that in the S10 and they have like three models or whatever the rumor is, uh, man, that's, that's a lot of displays with fingerprint scanners in them. I don't know if they're going to be able to make that many and them still be good, you know? I don't think that they'll put in display fingerprint reader in every S10 model. I think you'll have your standard S10, like the S9, and then you'll have the next model up, like the Plus, and that will have the fancy camera with maybe the in display fingerprint reader. I agree. I think that's exactly what they're going to do. That could make sense. I don't think that'd be weird, though, if... I don't know, you've got your, your regular S10 that looks like the S9 with the fingerprint scanner on the back, and that's just missing from the Plus model. That seems like that would be... That'd be strange. I mean, I guess it depends uh, who's supplying the 
who's supplying them and if they can produce, you know, 10 million of them. Allegedly Qualcomm. Yeah, that's what I heard is Qualcomm is going to be doing it. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just worried the tech's not there and Samsung's going to rush it and it's going to be, I don't know, weird and not good. Do you think we might see it first on the uh, foldable phone that's being announced later this year, maybe? Um, maybe. Yeah, um, so I think that one's weird, though. Um, also, I'll preface this and say, I think if you put an in-display fingerprint scanner on a foldable phone, the user experience on that is going to be just the worst thing ever, unless you put it in both screens. Because I was just going to say, where do you put it? Do you put it in the big screen, the small screen? Yeah, or if they're equal screens, like, aren't you supposed to be able to use it either way, and now one of them doesn't have a fingerprint scanner, and but it's not... I mean, unless you make it cover the entire display, then I guess you could do like what you do right now, where you just put your, you know, index finger on the back and it reads it that way. But I just, I don't know about that. I think we're just going to see a, you know, a glorified prototype in November. I don't think it's going to be anywhere near finished. That's my guess. That's kind of what I'm thinking. It won't release this year. I would be yeah. very surprised. It may get announced in November, but they'll release it in South Korea only in like February, and they'll make ten thousand of them and sell them for fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, speaking of super cool, very expensive prototype things, Peter, what is the coolest thing you saw at IFA this year? The coolest. Um... <laughs> Other than the uh, 8K LG TV, um, which was pretty nice, but not relevant for us. Um, I mean, it's still cool. We can talk about that. I don't think there's any 8K content, so like that's useless okay. if you don't have a PC hooked up to it. No. Isn't it, isn't it like $20,000 to... I think so, yeah. I think that was the price for it. I just remember it was really expensive. Yeah. Did, yeah, they, was, did they have any... It's expensive any... if they, uh, they showed it and then they hid it <laughs> behind curtains. Um, was it an OLED? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know um, it might have been at IFA, but I read a story somewhere that some of... I think it was LG's OLEDs were having burn-in problems, like on the demo floor. And they I were trying to, that. like... Yeah, they were trying to hide it because that obviously looks really bad. Yeah. thing with the OLEDs is they have to turn off at night. I'm going to standby so that they can refresh the pixels. Right. So if they're perhaps turning off the power entirely, that means that the pixels don't refresh. Um, I've got an LG OLED, and they actually tell you not to turn it off in standby for hmm. a couple of hours. Definitely gonna gonna wait for that tech to mature a little bit. I think. <laughs> yeah. Is there um, a button to turn it, like to turn the screen off and put it in standby mode, as opposed to like a regular TV where you just hit power and turn it off? Um, you can put it in standby mode just by yeah on the remote. Right. You can force it into the pixel refresh via the menu settings. Okay. And does the screen go dark, or is it like still kind of illuminated? Oh yeah, it just it just goes black. Okay. Because um, it's OLED, so its natural state is black. Yeah. Um, the phones. And and as far as refreshing the screen, is it uh, just sort of energizing the pixels in the background? I think it's just like a. I don't know, what's the term for it? Um, like. Perhaps just uh, cycling through all the various colors or something. Yeah, so I can actually, I, I can pipe in there a little bit. Because um, Samsung's AMOLEDs used to have crazy burn-in problems, and probably still do. Um, so selling phones, you know, you have live displays. And I think it was um, the S5s, man, we had just constant burn-in problems with those. Because, I mean, they're constantly powered up. The brightness is cranked to 100%. You know, they're sitting on a home screen forever. So you just get those icons burned in. 
Um, and with the S6, Samsung started releasing um, software for the demo phones where you would set up times when the store would close and it would basically show just like red, green, and blue blocks and it would just run those blocks all over the screen for like six hours. Um, and that helped cut down the burn in a lot. So the OLED probably does similar stuff to keep that from happening. Yeah, yeah. You'll see it today, though. You walk into like a Verizon and uh, most of the Samsung phones, if they've been out for even three weeks, you'll see burning kind of throughout it from just their demos. Yeah, I mean, you put that brightness at 100% and let it sit on a home screen for 12 hours, there's only so much you can do. Right. Yeah, that's true. But in fairness, practice, I haven't had any burn in on a Samsung phone in years. Like I said, if you don't have the brightness turned all the way up and you're actually using it like a normal person, then yeah, it's it's a non-issue. Right. Um, how about phones though, Peter? What uh, what phone do you think was the, the coolest thing you saw this year? Um, I quite like the look of the um, LG G7 One, surprisingly. We were, we were just talking about that. I think that's uh, LG could have a hit on its hands if it prices it right. Oh yeah, we don't know the pricing for that yet. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, Eric and I were talking about that. Um, I, I think the G7 One was probably the my favorite thing that I saw at IFA. Um, obviously, I wasn't there, but just news coverage and everything. Um, Kind of like the old school Google Play Edition phones, you know. Yeah. Uh, up until now, I feel like Android One has really been the. It's a budget option, you know. You see it on devices with slow processors and not a lot of storage. Not as bad as Android Go, but you, you know, there there is no flagship definitive Android experience with Android One, and the G7 One probably isn't. It still is not like a Galaxy S9. You know, the processor is a year older. It doesn't have the dual cameras or anything. Um, but it's still high end. It's still a really good phone, but not as much LG bloat. So that's really, really cool. And I'm very excited to see that. Like you said, assuming the price is somewhere around four or 500, not 800. Yeah, it could be a viable alternative like the OnePlus 6 or something like that. For people that don't quite trust OnePlus. What do you think of the Moto X4? I feel like that was, prior to this, probably the best Android one, at least in the States, that you could buy. I actually did the review on that one. I really liked it. Um, it feels like a Galaxy S7, that like slick glass with the fingerprint scanner below the screen. Still has that right. traditional design. Um, I mean, those things go on sale for like 300 bucks all the time. For $300, that is a phenomenal phone. Yeah, exactly. The price has always been right. That's an amazing price. Camera is just okay, though. Um, it has that dual camera set up, but it, uh, it's kind of weak in low light, which is disappointing. But, I mean, it's, you know, launched at 399 so got to temper those expectations. Right. But just as a general camera for the general user, it's, uh, I mean, it, it'll get the job done, I would think. Yeah, just don't, don't touch the portrait mode. Right. Yeah, that's. I've not used a good portrait mode on a cheap phone yet. They're all terrible. Even on the OnePlus, the portrait mode's not good. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Apple and Samsung are the only ones that really, really have that right now. Yeah. You didn't like the Pixel 2's portrait? Oh, and I'm sorry, and Pixel 2, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Pixel 2 is, is great. They do it in software, though, which is odd. Yeah, but... they have the one camera, and then they sort of do it themselves, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's been a while. I forgot about the Pixel 2. Yeah, um, that's surprising with the amount of Pixel 3 leaks that have been just popping up everywhere. Oh, that's crazy. I don't even need to watch the like announcement. Well, on a quick side note, what do you think of the conspiracy theory that they're deliberately putting out this fake, super big notch phone so they can surprise us? It's Google. Too many. They're not faking it. Google's just incompetent. Yeah. Right. 
It'd be cool though if they came out with some kind of crazy phone. Yeah, but they weren't. No. Yeah, I agree. It's just uh, these leaks just came really early. I am surprised it still only has four gig of RAM. Yeah, I thought they would have, would have bumped it up to six at the very least on the Pixel Three. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. Although I think four gig is still. I was gonna say maybe. Know, but... Maybe I'm not using my phones right. Do you guys actually notice a difference between phones with like four and six or eight? Four and eight, yes. Because I like I never have apps reload even on older devices with like three and four gigs of RAM. I never have issues with those. I agree. I've never had an issue. Once once I hit four, I've never used an eight, but I've used a six gig phone, and I've I've noticed no difference. Even like you said, a good phone with three gigs, I haven't had much much trouble. Yeah, Peter. Like, what are you? What are you doing? Are there like four hundred Chrome tabs open? Uh, pretty or... much. Yeah, okay. I was about to say that. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's about eight. Yeah, eighty Chrome tabs open at any one time. Man, there's a lot. <laughs> On Chrome and Chrome Beta, I have both installed. <laughs> and you're using them simultaneously? Uh, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one's the. Uh, Chrome beta is usually uh, incognito, no tracking, that sort of thing. But... Okay. Um, speaking of Chrome, did you get a chance to play with that Lenovo Yoga Chromebook? I didn't actually. I didn't. Um, the the Friday of the of Eva just kind of flew by. Um, That's day number one. It's busy. So it was. Uh, yeah, it was quite a busy day trying to get to every uh, like LG, Motorola, um, Sony, Samsung, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, hey, tell us about some of it. We'll uh, we'll come back to that Chromebook. Yeah. I'd jump in on the Sony, maybe um, the XZ3, um, which is kind of like just the premium version of the XZ2 that I reviewed last month um, still the fingerprint reader is still in exactly the wrong place on the rear panel um, <laughs> which is crazy um, but it was a it felt like a nice little phone that uh, I say little at six inch um, and it had an OLED panel which really made the colors pop as opposed to what I saw on XZ2, which was quite washed out. Um, it looked like that one's got Android Pie on it right out of the gate, too. Yeah, yeah. Which, it's a good thing. Uh, it's a really thick phone, too, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's not comfy to hold, either. It's slippy. Um, yeah, it's... it's and it's still got only a single camera. See, I feel um, like the uh, the XZ2 still have that problem, though. Um, I haven't, like, used one as a daily driver, but I've, I've held demos and stuff, and it, it almost feels like it's, like, a rounded back that's almost, like, a really, really tiny hill. Like, it's hard to get a grip on the back of that thing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's hard to hold. Um... And a fingerprint magnet. It's just terrible. It is, uh... Ooh, it is 905 US dollars. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, that, uh... I don't think Sony has the, uh... The brand power for that price. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't you rather buy a Note 9? Exactly. Yeah, for that price. That's Sony, though. Everything they do, like, they make nice stuff. I love Sony's products. I just refuse to pay for them because they're, like, 20% more expensive than they need to be. And they, they can't make their own camera technology work. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, their cameras on other phones are always so much better than their own phones. I've never understood that. The, the camera on the XZ2 was just terrible. It took ages to save a photo. If you tried to take a portrait mode photo it, or bokeh effect, um, it just took ages hmm. and the effect was crap <laughs> sorry 
no. I mean, hey, if if that's a if that's a complaint, throw it out there. I mean, I feel like we all pretty equally slam Sony's phones. They, I mean, they that's get decent fact. reviews. I I don't know if Eric, I don't know if you've ever reviewed one, but I've done a couple, and I mean, that, yeah, I've never reviewed one. I've I've had a couple, but I've never reviewed one. That's uh, just that's that's the trend, man. They're too expensive. The camera's not quite there. I said personally, I think the rest of the phone's great. I mean, they always have great displays, performance is good, you know, all that stuff. But they just they can't put it all together and tie a bow around it. The problem in the states is you just can't buy one at a, at a carrier, so no one really knows, you know, how many people are going to Best Buy and buying unlocked phones. I think it's not many. So the honestly. Fact that after starting there for the past couple months, a lot more than you would think. Really? A lo I was surprised. Wow. I, I think you're starting to see that more often now, though, um, with uh, with the carriers moving to the financing deals. Right. A lot of people want to. They just want to buy the phone and own it, and not have that extra weight on their bill. Right. Um, so you see more people. Maybe they buy this like an LG stylo instead of a Galaxy Note because it's three or four hundred dollars less. They can buy it, put their SIM card in, it, and just call it a day. Right. It's not everybody. I mean, we're still talking like maybe ten percent of people, and that's probably high. It's not even ten percent, um, but it's more than the like one percent it was five or six years ago. Well, what we, what we need to see, I think, and what I what I see happening slowly, is just more CDMA compatibility in some of these unlocked phones so you're not sony limited. actually um their latest software update on maybe the xa2 one of those it uh it did turn on the cdma compatibility for that so it does work with verizon now right because otherwise you're literally cutting off basically half the country of who can buy and who cannot buy the phone yeah which in a few years hopefully it won't matter because I know Verizon's turning off their 3G network at the end of next year right so once everything goes LTE fingers crossed you just see a lot more compatibility there across the board right Peter can't relate to that at all because your cell phone market is not nearly as stupid as America's <laughs> no no uh, you guys have a very complicated market it's so um, dumb yeah it's <laughs> It really is. <clears throat> then you have Sprint out there that just, I don't even know why they're still around. If you can catch Sprint in an area where the service is good, it's like hands down the best deal you can get. Right, but that the problem is, is how many areas are like that? I, I've yet to find one personally. Really, with you living in LA, I would think Sprint would be pretty decent there. It uh, the last time I tried it, uh, probably three years ago. It was, it was so bad. I don't know how they weren't sued. It, you know, that just you have these maps, these coverage maps, and you got not only what it wasn't bad service, it was just non-service. There was zero data. It was just no service. Yeah. Anywhere. Um, I know, like in Atlanta, it's fine. Um, if you live in Atlanta, Sprint's network is pretty decent. It, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what I've heard from people. Somebody's probably going to yell at me in the comments for saying that they're going to hate Sprint. But um, <laughs> generally, there's, yeah, there's big cities where it holds up really well. Yeah, I guess I'm just biased because I've had I've never had a good experience. And, I mean, if you go way back to like when they had WiMAX, that was pretty good at the time. I but, remember uh, WiMAX. That, that, that was my last that was my last good experience with Sprint. Oh, that was so dumb, though. Well, the reason I liked it, because they, uh, what was that big phone? The, Evo, the HTC Evo 4G? Yeah, the Evo was cool. The big Droid Incredible. That's why I went with Sprint, just for that phone. It was actually a great experience. Yeah. Was that the phone with the built-in kickstand? Yeah. Yes. Had a, had a 4.3-inch screen. Massive. Huge. Biggest phone huge. you'd ever seen. <laughs> They had that Windows phone. What was it? The HD2? Was yep. that that big Windows phone? And so this was kind of the Android. Everyone wanted that for Android, so the Evo was finally that phone. One of these days, I'm just I'm going to write. I'm just going to go ahead and write HTC's obituary, just like start to finish. You know? Just, I'm going to get that written up. 
so we can all get nostalgic over it before they finally implode and go out of business. Yeah, I don't know how, how much longer they can keep going like they are because it's just such a train wreck. Are neither of you buying the new uh, Exodus phone with blockchain? Uh, is that an HTC one or is it just one of the emails that we got? Uh, HTC, allegedly they're going to release it later this year. It's supposed <sighs> to be a thousand dollars. No, I won't. <laughs> yeah, I won't. I'm not. <laughs> Eric, do you get lots of emails about blockchain stuff too? I do, yeah. It's just, like, I think uh, me and Peter got one a couple months ago that we laughed about forever. Like, there was a, a maybe a music player, like an MP3 player that was, like, cloud-based and blockchain-based. And, like, what does that even mean? Yeah. <laughs> just, the emails now are just random product on the blockchain. And they just type up an email, send it out, and hope somebody covers it. Right. And we don't. Are you waiting for your dining table? Uh, no, I uh, <laughs> actually completely. So for for uh, for background on that one, I also got an email. Um, some company wanted me to review a. They gave me the choice between an end table, a dining table, or some dining chairs. Um, I really struggled to to figure out how I could tie that into Android phones. So unfortunately, I had to pass on that one. Wait, wait, I figured wait. out. I figured out that if I got the table. I could put all the phones on, take photos, and say, this is a really balanced table for laying phones on. <laughs> I just, what, I was, what was the catch? Did it have, uh, like, a wireless charging or Bluetooth? No, or it what? was just a dining table. It was just no, no. A... Wireless charging was optional. If you place the wireless charger on the table, it has wireless <laughs> charging. Right? Oh, that that's cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it was just, I don't know, sometimes you get those companies that, they just get a hold of a bunch of emails for blogs and they just shoot it out and hope for the best. Right. Um, I want to talk about that Lenovo Chromebook though, because that thing looks super cool. Um, it is a Chromebook with not terrible hardware and a really slick design. Um, it's got like an Intel Core i5, it's got eight gigs of RAM, but it's running Chrome OS instead of your usual like Pentium or Celeron processors and like two gigabytes of RAM and 16 gigs of storage, it's a legitimate actual Chromebook. Um, and kind of like the, uh, oh, Peter exploded over there. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but kind of like the Android One thing, I think that's really cool that we're finally starting to see Chromebooks that are not $200, that are not just designed for, uh, well, you just you know, you use this in a school or in a business for, you know, light web browsing and some email and that's it. Well, it's got that big screen too. So you're, you're getting more of a, uh, I don't know if I call it a desktop experience, but you know, it's not the small 11 inch or 13 inch screen. You've got that. It's like 15.5. I think it's a little yep. bigger than 15 inch. Yep. I think 15.6. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I mean, hey, that's standard laptop size. Yeah. The only yeah. thing that I don't love with those, because it is one of the yogas, um, so you know it'll fold back and it's a touch screen and you can kind of use it as a tablet. Um, man, a 16-inch tablet is big. Yeah. That's. I think that's it's more tough. if you want to kind of. I think it's more not so much to hold, but just to put on a table and then kind of work it that way. And I get that, but I mean they do even like the press images i mean they show it completely folded back like where the keyboard is you know flush on the other side of the display right yeah i guess there are some people out there with big hands that want to want to try to hold a 15 plus inch tablet i would just it's not even the size of your hands man i think you just need an extra arm right you're going to laugh uh the other day i was using my 17 inch laptop folded up Oh, see, pants versus zombies. <laughs> Peter's one of those people. There you go. I mean, does is it a good experience though? Do you enjoy it, or is it just like I'm going to do it in a pinch? It's pretty much a pinch. It was just um, for space reasons. Um, I had to have it at, um, at an angle type thing, and um, there wasn't space for the keyboard to jut out, so I had to fold it flat. 
but it isn't something I would do every day. Like, oh, I'm going to turn my laptop into, you know, fold my laptop in half. And it's not something to look forward to. Yeah, I could see it if you like started like a Netflix series or a YouTube playlist, and then you just folded it up and held it and like laid on the couch. I could see that. Yeah, just like prop it up on your legs or something and just watch. Yeah. Yep, um, yep and it's uh, up to a 4K display. It's an IPS display, so it's going to look good. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I think uh, the rare people like me that really like Chrome OS, I think it's a uh, a much needed offering in the market. Especially for 600 bucks, It's really yeah. not expensive. It's a good price. I think that same machine with Windows would be, what, $900,000? Um, what, an i5? Well, that's the thing is, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know what the base model has. I think it's got 8 gigabytes of RAM, but it may only have like 64 gigs of storage and a regular 1080p display. Yeah, I know it's um, got the 1080p display. Yeah, so, yeah, for 600 uh, I don't know. I feel like a 1080p Windows laptop. It wouldn't be 600 I don't know that it would break 1000 Okay. Because, I mean, I know you got to pay that Windows tax, but... Even so, it's a solid price for what you're getting, I think. Oh, yeah, no, me too. I would love to see Chromebooks. Um, I don't know, maybe... If nothing else, force Microsoft to just do a better job on other things. Bring prices down. Right. I really want that Surface Go, but five hundred fifty bucks. Yeah, it's still just kind of expensive. I just think it's too small. What is it? An eleven inch screen? Yeah. See, that's why I like it though, because I I want it for like an iPad replacement, but I can drop it into a keyboard, you know, and actually type something on it. Because I don't know if you've ever used WordPress on a mobile device. Yeah, so I'd rather just like pull my eyes out with a spoon. Hmm. It's, oh. it's bad. Inserting links into an article is just it's, crazy. It's the worst. Yeah, because you can't. I don't know how you guys normally do it, but on a regular, you know, mouse and keyboard desktop, I'm gonna copy the link. You literally just highlight whatever you need to hyperlink in WordPress, and you just paste it. Boom, done. But when you're doing it on mobile, you have to like highlight it and then scroll back up. But you don't scroll up the text box. You have to scroll up the whole WordPress window and then hit that little hyperlink button and paste stuff in. And that's. Uh... And then sometimes the box uh, flickers. Yep. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. It's, it's yeah. the worst. It is the worst. So I would, I would love a good Windows tablet for that. But then it kind of gets back to. I don't know, maybe, maybe Eric can shed some light on that. Um, tablet apps, at least like in the Microsoft Store, uh, none of the apps are any good. They're all pretty bad. The interface sucks. They don't scale well to huge displays. Um, kind of like Android apps. I feel like there's still very few good Android applications that work well on like a 15 and a half inch screen. Um, I agree. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, the ant like on my Chromebook, the Android apps, uh, some of them work. I mean, you can get away with it, but I wouldn't call it a a, a good experience. Like uh, Instagram, the Instagram app uh, blows it up, and you can't read all the text because it doesn't format properly, so everything bleeds off the screen. Mm. That that's kind of a common problem with Android apps. And then the Microsoft Store, I think, is just a waste. I mean, you've got a few things in there. You have like Microsoft Word and that kind of thing, but uh, or Microsoft Office. But as the general App Store for uh, Windows, I think for Mac too, I just uh, yeah, that, not great. I not great at all. That's how you know that desktops don't do well with an App Store because Apple could not strong arm developers and make it work. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's pretty amazing how bad the App Store for a Mac is. When you see how good it is for the iPad. Yep. Or iOS in general. It's just two different things, though. I think you, you still have so many people that 
Well, I mean, even like me, I just I'll download it from the internet and just get it installed normally. Right. Uh, well, Peter. Fortunately. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Real, real quick. Fortunately for a Chromebook, though, like uh, a lot of these apps now have kind of a, a, a web alternative that are pretty good. Like Instagram, if you go just go to Instagram and sign in on the web, it's a pretty good experience now. So you almost don't need the app. And then it formats properly. So there's a lot of apps that have a web alternative that work pretty well. So that's a, an option at least. That was actually one uh, one huge thing that I noticed at Google I.O. a couple years ago. Um, they didn't really talk about it at the keynote, but I got to hang out um, and just, you know, over the next couple of days, explore and go to some of the other conferences, people talking about stuff. Um, Google really, really hammered home the point about making web apps. You know, yep. don't, yes, apps for Android are important, but making sure your site works well on mobile Chrome is just as important. Um, I agree. And they've put a lot of work into that, and it, it really shows. You know, there's a lot of stuff. Honestly, I could probably just delete the app on my phone. Yeah. And just bookmark it. I do that with Facebook on all my Android devices. I do not use the Facebook app anymore because it's such a battery drain. Right. I'll just bookmark the mobile site. And it's just as good. I, I've, I've been doing that too. Facebook, Instagram, eBay, Amazon. I mean, they're just as good. And they still do the notifications because Chrome, you know, has its own notification system. Right. So you, you can really tell Google likes Android, but Google likes Chrome more, I think. Right. I think they see that as the future of their, you know, mobile and software division. And it frees up, you don't you know, it frees up space on these, you know, Third world countries, cheaper phones, don't have a lot of storage. It's an Android option. Go. Yeah, yep. exactly. Uh, Peter, what uh, what laptop do you have? I know we talked about it not too long ago. Is it a Chromebook or are you still sticking with Windows? Uh, still Windows. I've got the Dell Inspiron um, 7773 model. It's a 17.3 inch with Intel's 8th gen, gen processor i7, 8 gig of RAM, sorry, 16 gig of RAM, so that's, and 512 SSD. That's a stacked laptop. It's not bad. Really, really happy with it. Do Battery you, uh, life is great as well. Did you carry that one around um, at IFA? Everywhere, yeah. Uh, it's actually only about half a kilogram heavier than my old 13 inch laptop so not a big deal yeah that's not bad it's under three kilograms anyway which is okay what is that in freedom units though <laughs> <laughs> 2000 cheetos no um <laughs> um unsure actually yeah, that's okay. must be about seven pounds or so. Maybe. Yeah, I was just going to guess like five pounds, but it's seven pounds. That seems heavy. It does 2. seem 2. heavy. Yeah, it's 2.2 2 pounds per kilogram, I believe. Yeah. Hmm. Um, just looking through all the other big stuff at IFA. Um, the Did you guys see the new um, Qualcomm's APTX adaptive Bluetooth? codec thing yeah it's an adapt it's the next one up isn't it they've had three previous like uh, or two previous yep it was like aptx versions. and then aptx HD. hd yep yeah um i actually just wrote up an article that google is releasing a new uh headphone jack adapter the new one's supposed to improve the battery life on your pixel 2 because it's got lower latency and just more efficient which I didn't realize mattered. No. But, uh, so that's kind of related. Bluetooth streaming is going to get a little bit better. Um, I don't, I don't miss the headphone jack. I don't know if we've talked about that on any of the podcast episodes before. I really don't miss it. No, I, I think, um, the omission of the headphone jack has actually made me use headphones more often. I always hated getting tangled in the cables 
cable pulls out, your headphones pull off your head. With Bluetooth, you're free. Yep. I I, I don't I don't want that to sound like I think the removal of the headphone jack is consumer friendly because it's definitely not. I, I think nine times out of ten you should keep the headphone jack anyway. Um, but personally, yeah, I just I don't care. I don't miss it. Yeah, I think fortunately the technology has caught up to a point where it's uh, almost redundant. I agree that it should be there, but uh, it's not like they removed it so prematurely that everyone just was dependent on the dongle and there, was, there wasn't a viable you know, option. But I think Bluetooth has become good enough. There's enough affordable products out there that it's you know at a point where it's almost uh, forcing you to embrace the future. Do you guys have, um, have you moved on to the, like, totally wireless earbuds yet? I've got a pair of those Huawei Freebud things. Okay. I gave away the other month, but I haven't actually used them yet. I haven't heard I, I, Oh, go ahead. I, I haven't jumped on the earbud. I've never been an earbud fan. I'm always an over-the-ear headphone person. I think they both have their place, and I've got like these anchors that are over the ear. They sound fantastic. Battery life's awesome. Um, can't beat them for what they are. But like, I don't want to wear big headphones and go walk my dog, you know? Right. I Usually I want the earbuds for that. I've got a pair of uh, anchor sound bud curves. Um, you know, like they're still over the ear, but really, really unobtrusive. Not too heavy. Um, I actually have a review going up um, probably very soon in the next couple hours, I think is when it's scheduled. Man, Anchor's sound stuff is crazy good for the price. Yeah. Like, they've sent me a couple things recently to review, um, and just all of it for what they charge for it. It's it's insane. It sounds so great. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's hard to beat them at that price. Are you talking about ear earbuds or earphones? It's just all of it, dude. Just go anything with a speaker in it. If it's got anchor on it, it's like half the price that you would expect and sounds phenomenal. That's yeah. great. Anchor did not pay me for that, I promise. <laughs> um, Cue the comments. <laughs> right. Um, we got a got a cheaper BlackBerry Key Two LE. I finally got officially announced. I like the BlackBerry Key Two. Um, I did do a review on that pretty recently. It was a good little phone. Um, I think they should have. Uh, I like the concept. I mean, everyone's everyone's doing it. Motorola has their cheaper version. Samsung, Apple, Huawei. But uh, I think in this case, we should have just had a a key two that was a hundred dollars less from the start and then just run with that as opposed to making this stripped down cheaper version that kind of you kind of lose everything special about the key two with this and it's just basically a a phone with a keyboard at this point you don't have the you know the touch sensitive keyboard uh the camera is not as good i don't know i think you should have had a more affordable key two from the start and not had this second device so I think the point of uh, like of a cheaper iPhone or of a cheaper Motorola or a cheaper Samsung or whatever, um, it's really made for somebody that maybe is on prepaid or like for somebody's kid, you know, kind of like a, a phone to get you into the ecosystem to keep you buying that brand in the future. Um, I, I, do you guys agree with me on that? I agree with you completely on that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, Blackberry's weird because Blackberry's brand is a dude in a suit. Like, who is going to buy their kid a Blackberry Key 2 LE for their first prepaid phone? You know? Yeah. That doesn't... Could you imagine? You know, like, the kid gets bought or someone gets this Key 2 LE. Oh, is that the Key 2? Well, no. does it have the swiping keyboard? Do you have the gestures? 
Uh, no, this is the cheap version. Oh. The only gonna... thing I can think the only thing I can think of is maybe it's uh they're trying to target businesses that want to buy a thousand of these for you know their company and it's cheaper and but then like you said why not just mark the price of the key two down a little bit and give them the bulk discounts anyway exactly that exactly you know, and i'm gonna i'm gonna take a step back and say that if you give a kid a blackberry key two le no peter they're not gonna ask oh is that the key two they're gonna make fun of that kid because he's using a blackberry in 2018 <laughs> i agree it's, it's just such a it's such a weird move I don't know. Um, we also had a uh, Huawei's AI Cube that looks like a. It is a smart speaker and a 4G router. Um, it's not a cube. It's weird, but kind of cool. Yeah, but that, I was at the briefing for that. You know, so you got all these uh, bloggers and journalists, you know, taking photos, and then we had a Huawei person trying to activate it. Uh-oh. And it wasn't going well. Uh, Alexa was being screamed a lot. Um, there's my Alexa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's like they created a solution to a problem that nobody has. It doesn't have a battery. Yes, yeah, so you can't take it outside. It's not portable. And while the user case of, oh, well, maybe you'll take it to a hotel room or somewhere that you don't have Wi-Fi or would you really think of taking that in your backpack or suitcase to on a holiday? I'm not trying to take that thing through TSA. Yeah. <laughs> mm -mm. yeah it was just, it was, uh, I felt like it had been developed. Um, in conjunction with Amazon as part of their partnership. Um, and then maybe Amazon said to Huawei, hey, you need to build a smart speaker for us, show your commitment or something. Um, I, I guess I'm also looking at this from the viewpoint of being a Google Assistant fan as opposed to Alexa. Yeah, I was going to say, um, Alexa, shut up. Sorry. <laughs> it sounds like you do have an Alexa. Um, person, I don't have any um, Alexa stuff. Uh, it just kind of seems a little bit clunkier. I definitely like my Google Home speakers. I've got a couple of those around the house. Um, I wish there was more of this with Google Assistant in it instead of Alexa. It seems like everything has Alexa. Yeah. I feel the same way. I, I feel Alexa's um, clunky. Um, it's apparently very sensitive. Um, just talking about her has set Peters off multiple times. And now it's unplugged. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I feel like Alexa is clunky. The app is clunky. To get Alexa to do something new, you have to go in the app, enable the skill. Your home just works. The just funny works. thing is, is everyone I know with a smart speaker or any kind of smart home setup uh, has Alexa. I literally know no one that Alexa, has. It's Google way home. more popular. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's yeah, just definitely. that advantage of being first to market. You know, the Echo and the Echo Dot were new and shiny, and it took Google a year or so to catch up and even longer to roll out the you know, smaller, affordable one. Right. I think just more, you know, more appliances and, you know, smart products have Alexa as opposed to Google Home. Yeah, I hate that, man. You get on Amazon, look for some smart, like, light bulbs or locks or whatever. Um, everything works with Alexa, but you've got to dig to find stuff that works with Google Assistant. Right. Yeah. Not a fan of that either. Um, and the uh, Honor Play, was that at IFA, Peter? Um, it was. Um, that was launched during IFA. Yeah, because um, I know you were you were pretty high on that in the review. You liked it a lot. Yeah, it was pretty nice for the price, £279. It's a good price for, a very good price for 
a phone that um, has most of the same hardware as the Honor 10, which costs about 100 and more than 100 pound more, um, and a bigger battery and a bigger screen. Um, yeah, it was, it's a good device, really. Um, but if the uh, Xiaomi Pocophone F1 ever comes to the UK, it's going to blow everything out of the water. Yeah, OnePlus is sweating over that one, I think. Yeah. What did you think of, uh, did you see the uh, Bang & Olufsen's Biosound Edge speaker? Unfortunately not, no. Um, yeah, most of my time at IFA was just spent bouncing, trying to get from one mobile company to another. Right, right. So, yeah. Too much stuff to do in the short amount of time that you're there. Yeah. Did you see Hello. any interesting smartwatches? I saw a couple from Mobvoi, uh, which I can't mention, but I'm sure that you're going to get an email later in the month about. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Because I read that Sony had uh, some kind of crazy e-paper watch where the e you know where the screen wrapped around the band itself as well. I heard e-paper. Have have Rip Pebble. Yeah. What's that? Rip Pebble. Kind of like the Pebble, yeah. I love my Pebble. I didn't see that. But this one has so it's like an e-paper screen, but then the band it's like an e-paper band as well, and it all sort of works together have to look that up that sounds really interesting it's neat but i haven't really i've seen pictures but i just haven't read much about it i did get my hands on the sony protec f30 i think a wear os watch oh um chunky as hell really really chunky really um, yeah <laughs> but fully fully uh waterproof uh, which is quite nice it's a shame because, you know, back in the day, I felt like Sony was really one of the key players in the early Android Wear market, and then they just disappeared. Just like they did with the tablets. Yeah. yeah. They just I, stopped. I think you really got to blame Google for a lot of that, though. Yeah, no question. No they question. had tablets and watches like they mirror each other google had this super cool platform they were going to help manufacturers sell more devices and jump into this and they built it for them and they just kind of left them out to dry you know yeah and android wear had problems didn't get enough updates didn't get enough support the and tab. the only ones that kept going were the ones that were doing it themselves like samsung and samsung ditched android wear yep so I, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to hold Sony accountable for that one. I think it's Google's fault. Right. I always find it weird that Sony has never produced a Nexus device. Yeah, they, they never actually produced a device for Google. You know, like HTC had multiple chances, Samsung, LG. Um, but Sony was the other, a big player in Android, and it just never got that shot. Maybe it was price. I know that, uh, you know, the Nexus... Uh, the Nexuses are cheap. And like what we were talking about earlier, yeah. Sony likes to charge a lot. Like, I don't think Sony could have made, like, a Nexus 4 or a Nexus 5, like LG did. No, for sure. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And then when you get to the higher-end ones, you know, kind of going towards the Nexus 6P, which was still very affordable for what you were getting. I just don't know if Sony could have hit the price mark. Sony would want to charge a 1000 bucks for it. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, we've been uh, chewing everybody's ear off for about an hour. Anything else big from IFA you guys had questions about, you wanted to mention? Um, something I'm looking forward to reviewing is the uh, Acer Chromebook Tab 10. Um, it's a Chrome OS tablet meant for the education Oh, but that's, that's the tablet, though, not really like the laptop. Yeah. Yeah, that's that cool. one I'm curious about, too, yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, from all reports, it's a little underpowered. Uh, 
but um, I'm really looking forward to finding out what Chrome OS on a tablet feels like with a built-in stylus as well. Yeah, I think what, that what did you cool. think of uh, the Lenovo just their the Lenovo their yoga book their new one with the like the dual displays did you see that um, briefly that's the one with the e ink uh, secondary display for the keyboard yeah 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 it's supposed to be like much you know a lot more improved than last year yeah I think the original was quite poor to be honest um, right this one looks pretty good. People seem oh. to be typing on it quite fluently. Yeah, I think they have like a better like haptic feedback, so it feels like almost like you're touching keys. Yeah. Yeah, it's got a built-in trackpad, I believe, as well. The bottom somewhere. Yeah. Right. Well, at least we got a bunch of cool stuff to look forward to. Um, got a few more months in the year. Yeah. We got a few more uh, big phone announcements coming up, actually. Yeah. We got Pixel the, 3 on the 9th. We got the OnePlus 6T. Somewhere in November, I think. And the Huawei Mate 20, October 16th. Uh -huh. And there's that. There's some friend being announced tomorrow, I think, somewhere. Yeah, something. <laughs> obscure, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, we probably won't have to cover that one, though. <laughs> no. No. All right. Well, I think it's time for us to get out of here. Um, it's It's been fun. We'll do this again soon. Um, you guys remember to like, comment, and subscribe on this podcast on YouTube. Uh, follow us on all of our social media channels. We've got Facebook, Twitter, Google+. It's all going to be at Talk Android. Um, and we will catch you guys later.